the committee will come to order. Uh, welcome everyone to today's hearing on design patents and auto replacement parts. Uh, Chairman Conyers is over at the with the speaker and asked for me to begin uh, in his absence and expects to be back soon. I understand from Mr. Coble that uh, Mr. Smith is also on his way. Oh, is he? Oh, good. Um, well, then I will not say that. He will offer his statement in due course. Um, I uh, would like to um, thank Chairman Conyers and Absentia for holding, scheduling this hearing. Uh, intellectual property exists to create incentives for innovation. That's why it's in our Constitution. Uh, the Constitution grants monopolies for a limited time over the reproduction of creations in order to reward innovators for their risk-taking, creativity, and investment, and because we want to encourage others to do the same. These uh, government-created exclusive rights are crucial to the legal framework that promotes innovation in our country. However, they come with a cost, and we should not be blind to those costs. Any time government creates a monopoly over a particular product, consumers will pay more for that product, and further innovation based upon that product may be restrained. Such costs are justified when the exclusive right promotes, in the words of the Constitution, the progress of science and the useful arts. In other words, government should grant intellectual property rights when necessary to spur innovations that would not exist without them. Today, we're here to discuss one specific type of intellectual property, design patents, as applied to replacement exterior car parts. I think this, personally, is a textbook case of how the cost of government-created monopolies can, in some instances, uh, perhaps outweigh the benefits to society. Automakers understandably make large investments to develop new exterior designs. They do so because the design and style of their cars will have a big effect on sales. Uh, but automakers don't sell exterior parts through new car sales. They also sell replacement parts to repair a vehicle after an accident. These are crash parts. And in the market for crash parts, the automakers face competition from other suppliers. This results in significantly lower prices for consumers, both in the direct cost of repairs and the indirect costs that affect car insurance premiums. Unfortunately, the creative enforcement of design patents may threaten this competition. Federal court decisions have cast doubt on the application of design patents in this market, uh, but the International Trade Commission has gone the other way in a recent decision enforcing these patents against some specific crash parts. And as a result, uh, automakers in these cases, in this case, was able to demand licensing agreements and royalties, and of course the costs go up. Uh, one study found that independently supplied auto parts are already 34% to 83% less expensive than those sold by automakers. And if competition is eliminated, these prices could rise even further. Without third-party suppliers, effective competition in the crash parts market is not possible, and no consumer will ever look at the price of, of replacement exterior uh, parts in deciding whether to buy a new car. So the situation invites um, price gouging of consumers uh, after they have no other option. Now, I don't think these price increases are justifiable because automakers who we value and want to, to prosper uh, do not need a monopoly over crash parts as an incentive for design innovations. Uh, car makers have a powerful profit motive to develop new designs that attract new car buyers. And this incentive, I believe, is far more important than the aftermarket for uh, crash parts, which will exist and has always existed, even without a monopoly over crash parts. It's for these reasons that I introduced the Access to Repair Parts Act to protect competition <coughs> and consumers by clarifying that design patents may not be enforced against, against crash parts. Now, I know that some who oppose this, and certainly the right to oppose is fundamental, uh, have used words like theft and piracy to describe this actually rather modest legislation. Uh, but I think it's important to recall that uh, not every conceivable application of intellectual property is a natural right. I have great respect for genuine innovation. 
but I think uh, this din disingenuous invocation of um, morality to justify what I think are far-fetched monopoly rights really does a disservice to uh, legitimate intellectual property uh, rights. Now, I look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses gathered here today. The purpose of a hearing, of course, is to shed light on uh, the bills and the issues before us. And if there are witnesses who think I have misunderstood this, I look forward to hearing from them. I'm someone who is always willing uh, to learn. At this point, I would turn to the ranking member, Mr. Smith, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Today, we revisit design protection to determine whether the committee should amend existing law to help the after parts automotive industry. In a 2008 subcommittee hearing on design law, proponents of greater protection argued that current law provides insufficient help for innovators who want to prevent the misuse of their designs. Chapter 16 of the Patent Act allows an inventor to earn a design patent for any new, original, and ornamental design for an article of manufacture. However, the chief limitation on the patentability of designs is that they must be primarily ornamental in character. If a design is dictated by the performance of the article, then it is judged primarily functional and ineligible for protection. Combined with the high cost of patenting, this reality explains why many inventors including automobile companies, file for relatively few design patents. But auto manufacturers assert that automotive suppliers lose upwards of $12 billion annually to counterfeit products, and at least one prominent car company invests $100 million or more in the design of each new car line. So it's understandable why car manufacturers want a higher return on their investment. Not surprisingly, they've argued in the past that Congress should amend the Patent Act or the Copyright Design Statute to provide them with greater protection. But the legislative process is like Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Amending either the Copyright or Patent Act invites opposition from others who work in the automobile after parts industry. Their plea has less to do with the nuances of intellectual property law and more to do with competition and consumer choice. Independent garage owners fear that they will go out of business if copyright design law is extended to cover auto replacement parts or if the Patent Act is amended to provide more expansive protection to designs. In fact, the after parts industry now argues that we can't afford to maintain the legislative status quo on patent designs. The auto manufacturers are filing for more and more design patents under current law, meaning the independent garages could lose a war of attrition. It's just a matter of time and lawsuits. That's why Representative Lofgren has introduced H.R. 3059, the Access to Parts Act. The bill doesn't prevent automakers from patenting designs on replacement parts, but it does prevent them from suing competitors who replace cars, who repair cars with cheaper parts. The committee must therefore weigh these competing interests and the consequences of establishing the precedent of creating an exemption to design law that benefits the after parts industry. All of us understand the constitutional mandate to protect intellectual property rights so that those who fairly deserve to reap the benefits of their creative contributions may do so. At the same time, we must also ensure that our legislative efforts do not have an adverse impact on economic growth and consumer choice and savings. When we allow goods to be taken out of the marketplace and assign ownership rights to one individual or company, we should examine the fairness of doing so and the impact it will have on the market. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Smith, and uh, other members uh, without objection uh, will have their opening statements included in the record. Oh, I'm sorry, um, but Ms. Waters is not here. Ms. Waters uh, actually did request to make a statement, and Mr. Issa has asked for the same. So, uh, Ms. Waters, you're recognized. Madam Chair, Lady, I Chair. thank Chairman Conyers for uh, organizing this hearing, and I thank you for sitting in for him uh, in his absence. Uh, this hearing today is being held to discuss design patents and auto replacement parts. Indeed, this issue is of great importance to many of our constituents as it concerns the maintenance and repair of automobiles. I'm very anxious to hear from our panel of witnesses regarding the impact of this legislation, uh, whether 
regarding the impact this legislation would have on consumers and the auto industry. In the weeks leading up to this hearing, I have received many letters from leading consumer advocacy groups who believe H.R. 3059, the Access to Repair Parts Act, would promote competition and consumer choice. In these economic times when so many people are struggling to find employment, the last thing they should have to contend with is costly auto repair bills. The car companies contend that these parts are their original design and that this legislation would violate their patent rights. Consequently, over the years, many of them have lobbied Congress in effort to amend federal copyright law to enable auto manufacturers to obtain protection for their designs for individual crash parts through a design registration scheme. Moreover, the car companies are also concerned about the quality of replacement crash parts. They argue that permitting this uh, intellectual property infringement also exposes consumers to significant safety performance or durability risks. However, the Consumer Federation of America advocates for auto and highway safety will testify today that consumers pay the same price for automobile parts that some pay for high-speed computers and flat-screen televisions. So when many across the country rely on their cars for employment, I'm concerned that some of our car companies may be taking advantage of consumers in its strict control over the distribution of its repair parts. Therefore, Madam Chairwoman, I look forward to our witnesses' uh, testimony and hope that we can take a closer look at this issue that greatly impacts the American public. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Waters. Congressman Issa. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's always difficult in Congress to be lobbied by two sides and tell both sides that you see merit in their position and then chastise them for excess. Today, I believe that's an example. The auto companies have repeatedly asked for more than what they could be entitled to and come to this committee asking for protection that we're not permitted to grant. Often the argument is that replacement parts are inferior, dangerous, and thus will in some way be unreasonably uh, produced in a way that would endanger the public, and yet the request is of this committee, a committee that has no such jurisdiction. We have jurisdiction over monopolies, and we certainly have jurisdiction over patent, copyright, and the like. Having said that, <clears throat> the parts industry from which I came would certainly pride itself on its design patents and its right to have an ornamental look added to an automobile be protected, whether it's an aftermarket sunroof company, spoilers, uh, air dams, and the like, or even custom wheels. No company in the aftermarket would give up its right to its trademark, its copyright, or its patents willingly. So that brings me to a conundrum as the owner of 37 patents, some of which are design patents. How do we protect the inherent right of the manufacturer to have no confusion as to the <coughs> original maker, the quality, and the predictability, while at the same time recognizing that there's a huge difference between parts, for example, that would make a Ford Mustang into a Shelby Cobra when in fact it is not, and simply a repair part for an inner wheel well, maybe even a fender that has become rusted or damaged. I believe that this committee lacks the jurisdiction to do it all by itself. I certainly believe that the chairwoman, rightfully so, is is trying to find the right answer, but I believe that we must carefully make sure that this committee limits itself to the proper meaning of this intellectual property over which we have jurisdiction, and then moves on to the competitive questions with the Committee of Jurisdiction. For that reason, I have not signed on in the past, nor presently on this bill, but I do look forward to trying to get it right now and in future legislation. I look forward to the testimony of all of the witnesses, because I believe there is a valid middle ground. Since we're fortunate enough to have the right people here, I will again use the example that a Ford Mustang versus something that looks like a, uh, a GT500 uh, Shelby Cobra is not a small, ornament or small set of replacement parts, but in fact a huge difference. 
i often go to the the auctions and watch them also on t v in which the difference in the value of a twenty five thirty forty year old automobile based on nuance differences of whether it was a g t o or just another off the line car that had a few stickers put on it is significant and those significant differences should be respected when they belong to the manufacturer so with that madam chair i look forward to working together on finding the right balance and you'll back the balance of my time thank you congressman i say and without objection other members unless they wish to give their opening statement will be invited to submit them for the records and we will turn now to the witnesses i am pleased to introduce first Mr. Jack Gillis. Mr. Gillis is the Director of Public Affairs for the Consumer Federation of America. He's also the author of several books, including The Car Book. He received his MBA from the George Washington University. Second will be Mr. Damien Porcari, who is Director of Licensing and Enforcement for Ford Global Technologies. He oversees enforcement of Ford patents through licensing and litigation. He received his law degree from the University of Detroit Law School. Third will be uh, Mr. Robert Passmore, the Senior Director for the Property Casualty Insur Insurers Association of America. He specializes in automobile claims, but has worked on a wide variety of other claims issues. He is a member of the Society of Chartered Property Casualty Underwriters, having received this designation in 2002. And finally, we uh, will welcome Mr. Perry Sabin, an expert in design patent law, and principal of a boutique law firm specializing in design patents. He has authored many articles on design law, and he received his law degree from the George Washington University Law School. Uh, without objection, your written statements will be placed into the record, and we would ask that you limit your oral remarks to five minutes. You'll note that we have a lighting system. Uh, the light will be green. Uh, when it turns yellow, it means that you've used up four minutes, and when it turns red, it means your five minutes have expired. We won't cut you off a mid-sentence, but we do ask that you try and uh, live within the five minutes so that we will have time for members to ask questions, and we will begin with you. Mr. Gillis, will you please proceed? But you need to turn on your microphone. There's a little button there. Thank you very kindly. Congresswoman Lofgren, Ranking Member Smith, Member of the Committee, uh, I'm here not only on behalf of the Consumer Federation of America, but the Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety, the Center for Auto Safety, and Public Citizen, and we appreciate your invitation to appear today. Consider any of the following experiences, which happen every year to thousands of Americans. You back into a pole, someone in front of you stops suddenly, or you swipe, swipe your car in a cramped parking lot. Fortunately, few of these fender benders result in injuries, but they often result in shocking repair bills. Why are these repair bills so high? As Congressman Waters said, one reason is the parts that are needed to repair our cars. For example, Ford charges the same price for a fender as Dell charges for a computer and a flat screen monitor. An unpainted door from Ford will cost the same as a Sears refrigerator. And yet these are just the part prices. Costs can double with installation. In fact, computers, refrigerators, and many other products are better today than ever before for one reason and one reason only, competition. In the early 1990s, the car companies came to you. They came to Congress and asked for special design copyright protection on these replacement parts, and you emphatically said no. But as you can see from this chart, that hasn't happened. Um, there has been an enormous spike in the number of design patents which companies like Toyota and Ford have received on their crash parts. Now, unless there is something special about a Ford Fender for a 2009 Ford, which wasn't true in 2002, then I think you'll agree with me that this effort is not about some newfound design patents, but instead a newfound business strategy. The question you need to ask is why all of a sudden are these Fenders patentable? This is a business strategy and not an illegitimate use of our very important patent laws. What is particularly disturbing about these figures is that they are only selectively putting design patents on those parts where competition is available. The competition in parts that the car companies are trying to kill lowers prices, provides choice, and improves quality. 
In fact, many independent parts have lifetime warranties and are 34 to 83 percent less expensive than the car company parts. If the automobile makers succeed in using design patents to eliminate competition for crash parts, it will not only result in higher crash repair costs for you and me and everyone else, but it will increase our insurance premiums. On the safety side, as Congresswoman Walters indicated, delaying or ignoring the replacement of a headlight, a side mirror, or a brake light simply because they are too expensive will cause serious safety problems for the consumers. One of the most tragic ironies in the lack of competition is what I call the automaker's double whammy. Not only can the car companies charge whatever they want for the parts we need to fix our cars, but when they charge so much that the car is totaled, our only recourse is to go back to them and buy another one of their products. I applaud you, Representative Blockgren, for introducing H.R. 3059. It is not often that Congress is presented with such an elegant solution to a problem. By, by providing a repair clause in the design patent law, Congress will be providing consumer choice and protecting an open and competitive market. Such a very narrow practical exemption to the design patent law would not and rightly should not interfere with an automaker's right to prevent competing car companies from using their patented vehicle and part designs. Nine European and Australia consumers, countries, nine European and Australian, nine European countries and Australia, have enacted laws that specify that making the use of a matching exterior patented part is not an act of infringement. American consumers deserve no less. So the Consumer Federation of America, the Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety, the Center for Auto Safety, and Public Citizen believe that consumers need competitive crash parts. On behalf of these groups, I strongly urge Congress to adopt Congresswoman Lofgren's bill in order to ensure a competitive market with fairly priced alternatives to expensive car company brand parts. I'd like to thank you for the time before us and be happy to answer questions later on. Thank you very much. Mr. Gillis, we'll turn to you, Mr. Passlett, for your, uh, your testimony. Could you please turn on your microphone? There's a little button on it. Thanks very much. Congresswoman Lofgren, uh, Ranking Member uh, Smith, and other esteemed uh, members of the committee. My name is Robert Passmore, and I'm Senior Director of Personal Lines Policy with the Property Casualty and Service Association of America, uh, otherwise known as PCI. PCI is comprised of more than 1,000 member companies who together write 44 percent of the personal automobile insurance in the United States. I'd like to commend you for holding this important hearing, and thank you for the opportunity to present our views on the impact of design patent enforcement on automotive collision repair parts and express our support of H.R. 3059, the Access to Repair Parts Act. At its core, this is a consumer issue. The costs of auto body repair are borne by consumers, either, <clears throat> either, either reflected in their insurance costs or directly when they pay for repairs themselves. Auto manufacturers justifiably use design patents to protect the overall design of their cars from the other car companies they compete with in the primary market but some are also using them in unjustifiable ways uh, to keep competitors out of the market for replacement crash parts or par parts commonly uh, replaced following an automobile accident, such as fenders and doors. For decades, the availability of aftermarket crash parts has had a moderating effect on the price of such parts sold by the car companies. H.R. 3059 will help ensure that design patents will not be used in anti-competitive ways and that high-quality aftermarket parts will remain available, uh, helping to keep auto repair and insurance costs down. Since 2003, car companies have increasingly filed for design patents protecting not only o the overall design of the vehicle, but also individual component parts of the vehicles they manufacture. One company, Ford, has filed two, ca filed two cases at the International Trade Commission against companies in the aftermarket parts industry for allegedly infringing on design patents held by Ford for various exterior parts. Almost five years later, those cases were settled, but the desired result was achieved for Ford. There, were no, there was no competition for those parts during that time. And even though those cases were settled, there's nothing that would prevent Ford or any other car company from doing the same thing today. We recognize that the overall design of the vehicle represents a substantial investment in its development by the manufacturer that can and should be protected. While we claim no, expert, no special expertise in patent law, I'd point out that there's no room for innovation in, by alternate, alternative suppliers of these collision repair parts so as not to be accused of infringing 
on the car company's design patents. Their only use is to restore the vehicle's original appearance and function. They have no other use. In fact, many state laws require that alternatively supplied collision repair parts be of like kind and quality to car company parts. Uh, the aftermarket manufacturers must meet the requirements of those state laws, yet by doing so, risk being found to have infringed on design patents. Design patents, when applied to these parts in the aftermarket, uh, serve only to restrict or eliminate competition and facilitate a monopoly on replacement parts. Indeed, nine European countries and Australia have addressed the situation by enacting laws similar to what is proposed here in H.R. 3059. Studies have shown that the mere existence of a competitive part in the marketplace reduces the price of a car company part by an average of 8 percent per part, and that's even before a single part is purchased. To put the benefits of the availability of these parts in perspective, consider that even now, car company parts dominate the market for auto body repair parts used more than 70 percent of the time, clearly a dominant position. Alternatively, supply collision parts are used about 12 percent of the time and can cost as much as 60 percent uh, less than a, a car company part. PCI estimates that the eliminating the competitive influence of even that small market share for alternatively supplied parts would result in more than $3 billion in increased insurance costs uh, on an annual basis. The effect of a monopoly on replacement crash parts would not be limited to consumers' auto insurance costs. Consumers that pay for their, their own repairs out of pocket would bear those costs directly or might choose to forego repairs, leading to more rapid deterioration and depreciation of their vehicles. Higher repair costs also means that there's an increased likelihood of a vehicle being declared a total loss, compelling consumers uh, to replace the vehicle, pay off a loan that may exceed the value of the vehicle, and seek financing for the purchase of a replacement vehicle, all of which depletes savings. In tough economic times like we're currently experiencing, the impact of all these factors would be much greater on low-income or fixed-income consumers who can least afford it. We're not here today to advocate for the use of one type of part over another, but we are here in support of a measure that we believe would clearly benefit consumers. That's why we're part of the Quality Parts Coalition with companies like LKQ Corporation based in Chicago, AutoZone based in Nashville, State Flight based in North Carolina, and Avro based in Minnesota. Those companies believe, as we do, at its core, this is a consumer issue. Costs of auto body repair are borne by consumers, either reflected in their insurance costs or directly when they pay for repairs themselves. We believe that the Access to Repair Parts Act will preserve competition for the market for replacement crash parts and benefit consumers. On behalf of our members, we applaud Representative Lofgren and all the bill's co-sponsors for introducing this legislation, and we thank the committee for the opportunity to share our views on this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Passmore. Now we'll turn to you, Mr. Porcari, for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Lofgren, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee, my name is Damian Percari. I am an attorney with Ford Global Technologies. I'm responsible for obtaining Ford's uh, design patents. This legislation, if signed into law, would undo wins in, by Ford in the International Trade Commission um, against foreign manufacturers making copycat parts of our popular F-150 trucks. In these instances, the infringers purchased a single genuine Ford part and then they use low-cost laser scanners to make photocopy-like clones of our parts. And as a result of these infringements, Ford, our suppliers, our dealers are losing $400 million a year because of the loss in genuine parts sales. Certainly, a company can save money by copying a design as opposed to creating, testing, marketing, and selling an original design. This is not a revelation. It has been and will always be cheaper to steal something than to pay for it. Our opponent's argument is no more than a justification to deny all intellectual property rights across the board. Copycat parts hurt Ford, our employees, our suppliers, our dealers, and our customers. Ford customers rarely know that they are getting copycat parts because their installation is frequency, frequently concealed. Customers purchase a Ford vehicle for many reasons, including its features, its quality, its styling, and its value. But these factors are also important in a repair decision. But often, when customers take their cars to a body shop, they frequently receive non-Ford, non-US, non-UAW parts. You know, they may be given an untested part, an experiment, that may or may not function as intended. Ford doesn't test how copycat parts work or what interaction various copycat parts have with each other. We test Ford vehicles with genuine Ford parts. Copycat part makers talk of monopoly pricing by automakers if parts can't be freely copied. 
Yet for over 100 years, Ford has prided itself on selling vehicles with readily accessible and affordable replacement parts. <coughs> if pricing of genuine Ford parts made insurance unaffordable, we wouldn't sell any cars or trucks. So as of November 18, 2009, letter from a broad coalition of IP rights supporters makes clear, we strongly oppose and f the fundamentally dishonest practice of purchasing a single Ford part and making cheap copycat parts in low-wage foreign factories that are sold to the American public. Technology transformed copying books in the 70s, music in the 90s, and movies this century. It is now transforming car part market. Virtual 3D photocopiers are making it faster and cheaper to copy parts. That's why you're seeing a significant increase in the number of design patents filed in the U.S. It is in response to this increased copying of parts. If this bill becomes law, copying will continue to increase and more and more American manufacturing jobs will be lost. Auto companies, suppliers, and dealers will have no choice but to compete with cheap Taiwanese copycat parts by outsourcing manufacturing to other, even lower cost countries. The timing for this bill couldn't be worse. An International Trade Administration report entitled U.S. Automotive Parts Industry Annual Assessment 2009 outlines the problems facing the domestic auto parts industry and shows increasing imports of aftermarket parts from foreign countries. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that automotive part industry lost more than 300,000 U.S. jobs since, since 2000. Foreign, for foreign part copiers say that car companies are unwilling to uh, license copies. This is not true. Car companies vigorously compete with each other. We also compete with the salvage and specialty equipment makers on component parts. Beyond that, we have existing restoration part licensing programs where we license our designs, know-how, and brands to responsible companies that make high-quality parts. Ford has no objection to generic or specialty repair parts. Finally, Ford broke new ground and licensed LKQ to make and sell copy parts. We also required that LKQ clearly label copy parts as non-original equipment aftermarket. We collect a fee for the use of our patents that we reinvest in new vehicle designs. This settlement gives Ford customers up to five options when repairing their vehicle. They can, one, buy a new genuine Ford part, two, a salvaged genuine Ford part, three, an approved restoration part made to Ford specifications, or four, a generic or specialty equipment part that is not a copy, such as parts made by SEMA, and five, a, an LKQ copycat part that is not made to Ford specifications. This bill won't give consumers more choices. They already have five. This bill would merely eliminate compensation to the original American designer and spur more foreign copying. In conclusion, we believe retroactively targeting one group of intellectual property rights for unequal treatment would be a dangerous precedent, and we would be particularly so should it come from this committee with the, with the role to ensure that these rights are protected. We thank Congress for taking on this difficult issue of design protection. Thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions. The committee thank you, Mr. Polkari, and we'll turn to our final wit witness, Mr. Sabin, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairwoman Lofgren, Ranking Member Smith, other members of the committee, Thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Terry Sedman. I'm an attorney in private practice, and I specialize in design patent law. My clients rely on me to get strong design protection for their original designs and enforce them against knockoffs. Now, as a professor at GW Law School, I teach a course in design law. I'd like to emphasize that a design patent is a very unique animal because it protects the appearance of a product, how a product looks, not how it works. If you want to protect how it works, you've got to go get yourself a utility patent, which is not the subject of this hearing. Now, cutting to the chase, I think it is a bad precedent to carve out an exception in the design patent law for a particular class of goods, in this case, auto repair parts. The companies who get design patents invest substantial sums in research and development of new designs. They file design patent applications in the U.S. Patent Office, which are carefully examined 
by specialist design patent examiners who search all previous patents and publications to make sure that the applicant's design is novel, non-obvious, and non-functional. These are the statutory criteria for getting a design patent. And because of this rigorous examination, the issued design patent has a statutory presumption of validity, which can only be overcome in litigation by clear and convincing evidence. Now, the proponents of this carve-out for auto repair parts do not say that design patents for these parts are invalid. They do not say that these design patents are not infringed. Well, they can't very well say that because their knockoffs look exactly like the patented designs. What they are saying is that these valid and infringed design patents should be rendered unenforceable. Now, why do they say this? Well, they lost a big design patent infringement suit and have been enjoined from selling certain auto repair parts. The problem is, if this bill passes, every industry that loses a design patent lawsuit will petition the Congress to exempt them from having valid and infringed design patents enforced against them. That's why it's a bad precedent. Now, the proponents also say, if a valid and infringed design patent cannot be enforced against them, we will have open and free competition in auto repair parts, which should bring down the cost to consumers. But the U.S. Supreme Court has said in the Benito Boats case, and I'll quote this, the requirements of patentability embody a congressional understanding implicit in the patent clause itself that free exploitation of ideas will be the rule to which the protection of a federal patent is the exception, unquote. So once the Patent Office decides that a design meets all the statutory criteria, they issue a patent that gives the owner a time-limited monopoly in that design. This trumps open and free competition and is grounded in the strong public policy stated in the U.S. Constitution, Article I, Section 8, Clause 8, that the purpose of patents is to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, to encourage innovation, and reward inventors and designers for a limited time. Now, companies that are in the knockoff business flout this strong public policy. Their activities do not promote the progress of science and the useful arts. They lie back and wait for others to do this, to make a successful, unique design. Then, they copy the patented design, they're found guilty in a court of law, and they come here asking that they not be held accountable for their actions. The end game of this logic, that free and open competition is the holy grail, would result in doing away with patents altogether. Now, Mr. Gillis today said that an automaker would still have the right to stop competing car companies from using their patented part design. Well, this is a red herring. Companies get design patents to stop knockoffs. They are rarely asserted against legitimate competitors who are busy designing their own original and distinctive design. The last thing they want to put out is a copy of a competitor's design. In conclusion, carving out a particular class of products that undisputedly infringe design patents, just because this is advocated by the powerful insurance lobby, undermines the rule of law, is tantamount to selective enforcement, and opens the door to yet new exemptions advocated by yet new lobbies in yet new product fields. Pretty soon, the law fades away, and all that is left are the exceptions, just like the Cheshire Cat in Alice's Wonderland, which fades away, leaving only its devious smile. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, and thanks to all the witnesses for their testimony. Now is the time when members can uh, ask um, questions of the witnesses, and we will try and confine our questions to about five minutes. And I will begin. Um, Mr. Gillis, Mr. Porcari gave a list of five choices that consumers have for crash parts, including salvage parts, approved restoration parts, um, generic or specialty equipment parts. Why would these choices not be sufficient to provide competition in the market to keep prices down for, um, for consumers? It's a good question. Um, first of all, there really aren't five choices of parts. Two of the part choices that he listed are specious. 
they do not represent replications of the part which is what most consumers want we are not attempting to change the look the feel or the fenders or the hoods or the grills so the only real choice that a manufacturer that a consumer has today is an expensive car company brand part a salvage part which is of dubious quality uh, and in some cases that uh, mr parker talked about a part in which he has license the manufacturer of and what is very interesting about that alternative is that ford has entered into a special agreement allowing a company to make its parts is getting paid by that company yet mr polcari just told you that these parts are not made to ford specifications in other words they are licensing someone to make their parts and even they don't care if they meet their specifications this is the absolute height of hypocrisy I wonder, Mr. Porcard, going to that licensing uh, situation, you've licensed, according to your testimony, with this LKQ to make and sell uh, crash parts, and you also testified that um, Ford uh, got a royalty fee out of this arrangement. How was this, how much was this fee, and how is this structured? Yes. The exact amount of um, the fee is confidential. But I am able to tell you that we make much less licensing car parts than we do these little toy cars. That's why I brought that here well, to tell you. Was this an exclusive agreement with LK? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. And, you know, it's not like the, the, there was no infringement going on. There were 28 companies making thousands and thousands of Ford parts. So we didn't license into a vacuum. We licensed dozens of people making thousands of parts. The reason it was exclusive was LKQ brought with them these dozens of Taiwanese companies and stopped all of the non-infringers themselves. They had control because they had the purse strings. They were buying from the Taiwanese. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is, uh, I was talking to Mr. Smith before I left, it's a, it's a hard um, audience you have up here because I think all of us have cars that have been in crashes. <laughs> and I, um, I'll just speak, my daughter totaled my car. Um, but it, the, the crash was such that it didn't even set off the airbags. I mean, it was, it, but because the parts were so expensive, the insurance company had to total the whole thing. And I was thinking about your comment, Mr. Porcari, about you know, low cost foreign manufacturers, but this was a Prius. I mean, and so I think, and I guess this is to Mr. Gillis, since you've taken a look at the whole market, not just Ford, aren't foreign auto uh, companies also engaging in these design patents, and wouldn't that potentially have the impact of disadvantaging American uh, parts manufacturers? Well, well, absolutely, Congresswoman. In fact, uh, I'd like to submit for the record this uh, picture from Auto News in which 52% of the suppliers to the 2008 Ford Taurus are foreign companies. In addition, this year, Ford's latest models, the 22 models that they're offering the American public, nearly half of them are built in foreign countries. So for Mr. Polcari to come here and keep using the word foreign as if it's a dirty word is again, I think, an example of the extent that the car companies are trying to go to protect these monopolies. And he mentioned earlier that it cost him four mi $400 million because of parts that were competitive in the marketplace. Well, guess who saved that $400 million? We did. And guess who will pay that $400 million if he gets to patent all of these parts? And that's what we're talking about today. Thank you very much. And I'm not going to go on at too length. I just thought it was important to note that as far as you know, I'm not, I don't want to hold myself out as an expert on design patents, but I think the most significant case in our courts was the Chrysler case that the circuit court really held doubt about about the, the design patents, and it's only the, the international decision that has brought this into play. It wasn't the U.S. court system that brought this into play. Wouldn't, isn't that correct, Mr. That, that is true, and that's, you know, that's what's particularly ironic about this particular situation. Consumers in Europe have a right to these parts. They are able to buy and make choices in the marketplace and are able to 
get the competition they need to keep the crash repair down. And what's particularly good about it is when there's competition, not only do prices go down, but quality goes up. And Mr. Bokhari was talking about quality. I mean, with all due respect to the members of this committee, uh, to talk about car company quality in this environment, when last year 50% more cars were recalled than were even sold, and this year we've already recalled almost twice as many cars have, that have been sold. So uh, the car uh, companies aren't. I'm, I'm going to cut you off because I don't want to set a bad example of going over five minutes, and I'm going to turn now to Mr. Coble for his questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. But good to have you all with us. Mr. Passmore, and I'm going to give Mr. Bokari a chance to respond after you respond. If I read Mr. Bokari's comments, he indicates that the, that the auto insurance industry sets the, the insurance premium prices using Ford parts and then gives the consumers less expensive alternative parts. And furthermore, suggests that the insurance companies perhaps don't inform the consumer when they're getting these alternative parts. Now, what say to you to that, and then we'll hear from Mr. Picard. Well, I would say neither one of those statements are true. Um, first of all, regarding the question of rates, uh, rates are set based on historical lost, inf lost data, um, and that's based on whatever has been paid for repairs in the past. And I think you heard me say in my testimony, the market for replacement parts is currently 70% car company parts and 13% aftermarket parts and 12% salvage parts. So th that's the kind of marketplace that's being reflected in the loss costs that have been paid by insurers up to this point. And going forward, if you change that market, it, you know, if that 70 percent becomes 90 percent, then it's reasonable to assume that loss costs are going to increase, and that's that could impact in, impact rates in the long run. Well, Mr. Picard, did I interpret you correctly? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. The, and when a new vehicle is um, it released by Ford. Before the vehicle is sold, we are required to provide to various insurance companies across the country the price of the components that go into uh, making that vehicle as well as the, the time it takes to repair the vehicle for certain repairs. That's the rate. Those are the prices that insurance companies use to set the uh, policy. Well, I, I don't know if that's, I, I don't believe that's, that's true. Um, it's true that there wouldn't be as much loss history for a brand new model of a vehicle, and I guess you'd have to have a reference point at some point. But it's also true that vehicles that have just been, you know, the first year of manufacture probably don't have aftermarket, uh, aftermarket options available. Um, perhaps uh, some others could respond to that. Well, let, let me move along before that red light illuminates again. Uh, <laughs> is it not true, gentlemen, that, that all state permit the, permit the use of alternative collision repair parts and that most states have laws ensuring disclosure to the consumer when they're used along with a good number of states that require those parts to be of like kind and quality in form, fit, and finish. That, uh, is that correct? That is correct. That's correct. Uh, 30, most, 39 states require that you have to identify the parts being used on the estimate. Another 37 states require a specific disclosure that aftermarket parts has been used. That's after you've already listed them. And uh, 31, per, uh, 31 states require that you have your disclosure includes that the warranty on the non-car company parts is not provided by the car company. It's provided by the company you manufacture. Now, Mr. Sadman, I've ignored not intentionally you and Mr. Gillis. Either you want to get your oars into these waters? No, that's not my, uh, that's not my. Mr. Gillis? Yes, I think there are more than adequate consumer protections in every state, uh, and those protections not only are important for consumers, but they foster competition. I have no further questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Roman yields back. We'll uh, turn to Mr. Gonzalez, who's been sitting here from the beginning before uh, Ms. Jackson leaves. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And just real quick. Uh, Mr. Saidman, in, in your written testimony, you read it. A design patent protects only the outward appearance of a product as shown in the figures of design and so on. Unlike a utility patent, a design patent does not protect the function or structure of the product, only how it looks. Correct. Okay. And the courts seem to be agreeing with you. And yet we know that Mr. Gillis, in not his testimony, but in his response, said the objective of having the alternatives is replication is appearance, right? Exactly. Okay. 
So now that's where Congress comes in, because the courts are basically saying, you want to do something about it, go to Congress. And we're here today. So as members of Congress, we can actually take a lot of things into consideration, and if we're going to modify a law that the courts now would be operating under. You said there's a public policy consideration as to this design patent. In this particular instance, identify the public policy consideration. I mean, why would we have the law? I mean, it, there has to be a public policy consideration in everything that we do. Well, the public policy is expressed in the Constitution to promote progress of the science, to promote the useful arts, to reward innovators, to encourage research and development, and to produce new and original designs. And the deal that is made with the designers is that we will give you a monopoly for a limited period of time in exchange for your efforts and your investment and your original designs. And the public policy is simply to, to uh, adhere to that. Congress would have to believe that we're not frustrating that public policy by making some sort of a carve-out or exception in this case. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But I think everyone really looks through that argument and doesn't really see that it's quite valid. All they know is that it's probably cornering the market. It's about having a monopoly on replacement parts. I mean, is that what really is going on? Because I, I think many members just look at it. I think Mr. Isaac kind of alluded to it, uh, and I'm not speaking for him because he could have meant something totally different. But you, you know, you guys are competitors. And right now, someone has a corner on the market. And what's the impact? What's the public policy impact? The impact is the consumer pays a lot more money. I don't think that's really in dispute. Now, Mr. Porcari, you may dispute that. I still remember we used to say, if you sell me a car for 40,000 bucks, you're selling me the whole package and you're putting it together for me. But if I ask that you sell it to me piece by piece, I probably have a quarter of a million dollar car. I don't know if you agree with that. But uh, what I'm trying to point out is just what's practical out there, what's really going on in American society. And the utility of law really should reflect what is going on out there in American society and how the best interest of that society is served. I happen to think that if something costs the consumer an inordinate amount of money, unnecessary. And I don't think that, I know what you said, Mr. Porcari, I think you said uh, if it was so unreasonably priced, it would not be affordable. Maybe something doesn't have to be unaffordable before it is unnecessarily expensive. And that is not good for our economy. So if you'd like to respond to what I think, the public's having this conversation as we speak, if in fact they're watching or if they're interested in the subject matter. Well, one, we're very proud of our cars and our affordable replacement costs. I'll give you this example that, that uh, Mr. Gillis used, and that is a Dell laptop or a Dell computer. I have a Dell laptop, a Dell Latitude D630, and I looked up the replacement part cost of that screen. If I were to break my LCD screen, it would cost $245 to get a replacement screen. I also have a 2010 Ford Show Taurus, a great car, made in Chicago, the newer version of the one Mr. Gillis showed you. If I were to dent my fender, that fender has a replacement part cost, manufacturer uh, retail price of $303, but I found it on sale on the internet, two clicks on Google, anyone could find it, for $216.47, less than the replacement cost of the Dell laptop screen. I don't think our parts are overpriced. I think they are affordable, and that's why people buy Ford cars. Mr. Gillis, I, I probably have 30 seconds left. Okay, yeah. First of all, it's t ridiculous that Mr. Bolcari would have to pay $230 for a flat screen for his Dell, but he, the reason why he has to is because he can only get that from Dell, and that's our point. Mr. Sademan admitted that these designs were not to protect the car companies from copying each other, but in his words, to stop competition. And that's what we're talking about. I'm not a patent attorney, but I just heard him say, we're not worried about car companies copying each other. We're worried about stopping the competition. And from the consumer perspective, we're worried about keeping competition open. There's 73% of the car parts out there have no competition right now. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll turn now to Congressman Issa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Gillis, you, you made a statement that I just want to make sure we correct for the record. You, uh, you cited the amount of recalls. If you're not aware, uh, hopefully after the, uh, the Toyota hearings, you would be aware that if you copy perfectly cars subject to recall, you will get recallable parts. So unless you're implying that these companies have vast engineering that somehow would make them better than the original parts and less likely to a recall, maybe that wasn't the best sighting. Well, actually, uh, Congressman, it, it's not a bad idea because these parts also can be recalled by the U.S. Department of Transportation the same way car company brand well, I, parts I appreciate can be. that, but so if, if they copied the foot pedal that was a little too long of, uh, uh, on, a, on a Toyota, they would end up hitting the carpet just the same. Uh, you know, I, I spent 20 years designing and producing for the auto aftermarket. Nobody could be more interested in not allowing a monopoly of the car companies. I was uh, a participant and a contributor to the unsuccessful Chrysler case in which we tried to define and thought we were accurate that inside a car dealership, the car company is a monopoly. And so when you want to sell an aftermarket radio or an aftermarket car alarm, in the case of my company, that the uh, the prohibition by the manufacturer and the insistence on only their parts was in fact an antitrust violation. No question at all. I'd be, I'd be there for you relative to the aftermarket. In this case, I have a different concern, and, I, and maybe I can use uh, Mr. Bakari uh, it, as my uh, stalking horse for this. Uh, if your interest is related to your creation of an art form or a design, as, as by definition, when you go to the patent office, you say it is, then isn't it fair to say that the the question of the quality of a replacement part, the durability, all of that, is actually not within the purview of this committee. So would you mind if we only address the portion that is related to the rights in a design patent? Uh, Congressman Smith, you're correct that it's not relevant. Thank you, but I'm a little less than Congressman Smith. Uh, I'm ISA, but that's all right. I'm sorry, Congressman ISA. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, you're correct when it comes to enforceability of a of design patent, but it, by losing our ability to enforce the patent, we are also losing our ability to control who's making copy of our copy. Well, and I want to go to that immediately because uh, I want to try to address both if I can quickly. Uh, currently, you get design patents for 14 years, 10 years minimum under TRIPS, right, in the U.S. Uh, 10 years is a very long time in the cycle of an automobile, isn't it? Basically, at the end of 10 years, you're not interested in making the parts anymore. Wouldn't that be true? We are required by law to make the parts for 10 years, but yes. Yeah, it gets it gets a little tough. You end up in the salvage yard. Uh, I'm I have a lot of historical uh, automobiles, and trust me, it's I know I can get parts certain parts for the Model T, but they're pretty limited. Uh, so let's let's go through this. If we were to protect your original design, not based on the historic uh, design patent, but create a category much more similar to the the way the French protect dress designs based on fashion. And we were to give you a lesser time, but in fact, that lesser time was long shorter than the cycle of the automobile, but long enough for the original first use of a, what some people might call trade dress, even though that goes on in perpetuity, but to that part. So we give you a patent on the whole car for let's say three years from uh, the origination. If you absolutely had that, would you be more satisfied that you had that? And if not, why not? Enforcing a design patent is very expensive, millions of dollars. And we have, we have a very good track record. We, we sued three times, not two. But um, even we're at about a 50% track record. OK, so well, then I let me make a follow-up if, if the if not, why not uh, appears to be you're not interested. If, on the other hand, we said to Ford, GM, Chrysler, Toyota, and the rest, look, in this country, uh, we're perfectly willing to allow you to get your royalties, but those royalties cannot be unreasonably withheld, let's say, by everyone who has ISO 9000, meets the, the basic criteria for, quote, quality. 
a compulsory license that you could not have a monopoly but you could like the copyright holders in most cases you could you could be guaranteed income but not guaranteed a monopoly would you be interested in that we would study it specifically if it included the elimination of these enforcement issues thank you madam chair i'm just regret that there is but so little time to ask Thank you, Mr. Issa. I'm, I, Ms. Jackson Lee is not uh, present at the moment, so we will oh, uh, we'll go to Ms. Chaffetz and then to Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd like to, just to, so he can finish this, uh, yield my time to uh, of Mr. Issa. So you, you were saying, though, that, that the idea of a compulsory license with provisions that would give you the reasonable uh, control over your license, w would that be of interest to you? You said there were other factors. Briefly, can you tell Mr. Chaffetz those? Yes, certainly. Um, our parts frequently include contribution by suppliers. I cannot give away what I do not own. So, for example, on a headlight, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of patents owned by the supplier on that headlight. I merely create the original uh, appearance, the ornamental appearance of the headlight, how it's made, how it works, are not mine to give. Well, sure, certainly. So we've recognized that utility patents underlying would not be included, and therefore they would have to get those utility rights, or they couldn't do the, the if you will, design. Mr. Gillis, are you uh, intrigued by that at all? And, and I want to yield back to the gentleman. Uh, yes, I'm intrigued by that, and the question becomes, will the car companies offer these in the open market at fair and reasonable prices? Um, but well, certainly a licensee would offer them in the open market. It, it would they, not well, they may be, they may be, well, in other words, what, if I understand what you're saying is that uh, the car companies would be given the patent rights, however, they would have to share licenses to manufacture those parts. Right, everyone up in here on the dais recognizes that, let's say, in the music business, and, uh, that they, there's a compulsory license. If I want to uh, perform I've Got You, Babe, for which I would be paid very little and booed. Uh, I have. I'd, to I'd pay to see you. Sam. Thank you. Many <laughs> might, but I, I have. To, I have to pay, and yet I have a right. A, there's a compulsory license in which I have a right to get that. That that situation exists in other law. It also exists uh, in some transition in the patent rights in healthcare. So it's not without precedent in U.S. law. It would not be totally new, but I think for all of us on the dais who have seen both request by the manufacturers to have totally exclusive rights, which you uh, obviously object to, and then the idea that they have no rights or that immediately the product be available and without control over uh, quality. Although we have a limited role in that control over quality and so on, the fact is that confusion as to source and quality and the, the harm to the Ford Ma emblem as to quality is in fact within the purview of this committee and that's why I asked if we could begin notwithstanding the general lady's uh, starting point talking in terms of a solution rather than simply two problems that come back to this committee perennially well first of all again I have to disclose that I'm not a patent attorney however um, there is some question as to whether or not design patents should even have been issued to these particular parts because they are, in many cases, functional parts of the car. A fender performs a number of functions. So um, that's one issue that would have to be addressed. If, in fact, there was consensus that these are legitimately earned and, and important design patents, then your solution, as long as it opened the market to consumers, so that we would have many choices at fair prices sounds reasonable. But I think first you'd have to address the issue of whether or not the patents are in fact appropriate in the beginning. Certainly. Uh, other comments, uh, particularly, uh, I mean, I, I think from the day as we're not prepared to strike down design patents uh, without recognizing that it goes far beyond the auto company right now uh, with similar, that the Dell notebook has a design patent on it too. Please, anyone else that would comment on sure. this direction? Um, a couple of comments. Uh, uh, Perry can tell you all about the history of design patent law, but for example, on functionality versus ornamentality, 
we make, I believe, 12 different grills to fit an F-150, each looking completely different than the other to distinguish our series. That by definition says that these are not functional grills. There are many, many ways to make a grill, and that's not enough. The public can probably buy 40 to 50 aftermarket grills for that F-150. So I think from a functionality argument, we clearly, we clearly proved in court that, that these patents are not functional, that they are ornamental. That is, in fact, <coughs> excuse me, the test for uh, ornamentality. If the design can be embodied in any of a number of different ways and perform the same function, then it is not dictated by function and is therefore ornamental and meets the statutory requirement. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. I see our time's uh, within seconds, so we'll come in under and yield back. Thank All right, you. the gentleman yields back. We turn now to the gentlelady from Texas. Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and I uh, thank the witnesses for their presence here today. I'm, I'm just going to start uh, with Mr. Pokari. What, what, uh, what is the body of law that you are uh, basing uh, your argument on as you represent the um, auto manufacturers? What, uh, expanded beyond patent, but do you have case law uh, that uh, discerns between the automobile design, which means if you come out with a flying Thunderbird that really flies, um, and you want no one to know about that, and I would, I would, I'd get that real quick. There, 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 uh, there, there are. Um, you haven't seen our new Ford Show Taurus? It flies. I does it really? I, I um, but use us for a little in engagement. I want you to know your Ford Taurus station wagon took my children around. Uh, we had a good time in it. But um, well, let me, three what is the body of law beyond patent law it, for, the, it, for the grills and extra? There exterior. is in trademark law, I'm not a trademark expert, trade dress, but within patents, there are three types of patents. There are utility patents that cover the functional aspects of uh, an article. There are design patents that address its ornamental appearance. And then there are plant patents, which are quite similar to design patents. They are directed to the appearance of an asexually reproducing plant. So we, Ford, did not utilize trade dress or trademark arguments. We focused exclusively on design patents. We actually didn't even bring in utility patents because we really wanted to clarify the issue and bring it into sharp focus that car parts are protectable by design patents. Uh, give me the last one. You had utility, ornamental, and what's the third one? Plants. So you focus mostly on the actual design and consider the grill and other parts part of that design. Is right. there a case law that uh, has recently gone through the courts that has uh, reinforced your position? There, there are, uh, and, and Terry is much better at giving you case law. Well, I'm going to yield to him in a moment and as <laughs> before I go to... Uh, Mr. Yeah. Ellis there. Our, our cases, we had three cases in the ITC. One went to decision. In that, in that case, um, the, the ITC judge found that the designs were valid and infringed. I've heard reference to the Chrysler Auto Body case, a S Sixth Circuit case, I believe, years back on a summary judgment found that the Chrysler Dakota Fender was functional. That never went to trial. It was done on uh, summary judgment, and we think the court got it wrong. Could I ask your team to provide uh, this committee with an update on case law that you, uh, whether it's uh, administrative decisions and or case law that you've relied upon? Yes. I'd appreciate it. Mr. Um, uh, Sadman, would you uh, answer the same question, but in, in addition to that, um, act as a, uh, as this is a tutorial very briefly and, and tell me whether or not competitive issues are taken into consideration on the design uh, cases uh, under patent law. They uh, basically strictly on the idea that someone proves that it is a unique to them and then decision is then made. <coughs> well, design patents are part of the 35 United States Code. It's a distinctly different kind of patent than a utility patent. Design patent protects only the look of a product, how it looks, not how it works. And the statutory criteria are that it must be novel, it must be non-obvious to a designer of ordinary skill in that field, and it must be non-functional or ornamental, same thing. It's non-functional when there's other designs that can embody the same function. So when those statutory criteria are met, the design patent is issued, 
and the owner has 14 years uh, period of exclusivity in that particular design. So how would you solve a problem uh, that consumers raise, that the cost is higher, that when they go to their local uh, car fix-it shop or their uh, distributor shop, which I guess it's a lot of do-it-yourself going on right now, uh, and uh, they can't get, the distributors can't get it and the consumer can't get it. How, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I think... As, isn't a consumer, isn't a distributor, uh, couldn't a distributor buy it from uh, the manufacturer? The distributor gets it from the manufacturer and, and resells it, I uh, understand, to the um, end seller. Right. But but I'm not sure exactly how the chain of distribution well, works. Then let's, and I know that, but I'm trying to get to how the distributor can, in fact, be made whole by um, getting this in a manner that allows them to lower the cost for the consumer. Well, you know, um, part part of the, the the fact of the matter is that the patent system creates um, the ability of the patent owner to control the price within a certain range. They can't flout what the market says. They can't price their goods outrageously. But the patent, the way the patent system works is that the patent owners have the ability to exclude others from making, using, or selling the patented item. That's the way it works across all industries. That's the way it works in pharmaceuticals. Uh, you don't have the generic drug makers coming to Congress and say, we want to make generic drugs before the patents on these drugs expire. They sit, they wait, the patents expire, and then they jump into the market, and you have the increased competition. If the gentlelady could yield. I'll yield if the gentlelady uh, chairwoman would indulge us an uh, additional I've got to ask time. unanimous consent for an additional minute. Uh, without objection. Uh, and, and I have a question for Mr. Gillis, yeah. so I'll yield to you for a I, moment. I, I would only point out that, yes, the generics are in here asking for early rights I was going to say time. that as well. And the gentleman the, yields back. No, <laughs> that, that is not his fault for not being uh, uh, keen on uh, what generics are doing in pharmaceuticals. But let me just quickly ask, Mr. Gillis, I went to uh, the gentleman uh, first so that you could have an opportunity to um, respond, if you will. One of the questions as you respond, because uh, you know my line of reasoning, was the impact on consumers. Respond to the concern about safety. Uh, maybe it is uh, if someone putting on a grill incorrectly, impacting on Ford or someone else negatively when that grill falls off. So why don't you respond uh, to safety and the competition issue? Uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman. Uh, there are two safety issues. First and foremost is the fact that many consumers who can't afford these overpriced parts may not replace a mirror. They may not replace. Um, uh, certain parts of the car that are important for the safety of safe operation of that vehicle simply because they can't afford to. So that's the number one problem. Uh, the number two problem, and it, it, it sort of alludes to uh, Congressman's question, um, these parts, if there are safety issues associated with them, can be recalled by the U.S. Department of Transportation, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, NHTSA does have the ability to take responsibility for these parts. So that really shouldn't be an issue. It's, it really goes back to your first question of competition. And I have to go back to this drawing right here. When you think about the fact that 73% of the parts are only available from one source, that's been around, that number's been pretty consistent for all of these years. And it's only recently that we've seen this exponential increase in these patents. So that's why we suggest that this is a business strategy and not a strategy to protect those vendors, which they've been making since the beginning of this chart. The gentlelady yields back, and we um, have no additional I members seeking time. So uh, I would uh, like to thank all of the witnesses for the testimony today. Without objection, uh, members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions, which we will forward to the witnesses. and. If that should occur, we would ask that you answer as promptly as you can so that your answers could be made part of the record and the record will remain open for five legislative days for the submission of other material. I would just like to note at, in closing um, that the bill which I have introduced, uh, we've had a wide-ranging discussion, but the bill only applies to the enforcement of design patents against repair parts 
Um, and in that case, it, the repair parts must have the sole purpose of restoring something to their original purpose. So this is really actually a very narrow uh, bill uh, oriented to a very large problem for uh, consumers. And I just thought uh, it was worth reiterating that point since we've had a wide-ranging uh, discussion. And clearly, uh, Congress has a role to play in the patent law. I was interested to hear of the three kinds of patents, but there's still another uh, until Bilski has decided uh, business methods. So sometimes the courts uh, answer the question before the Congress gets around to it. Uh, but that doesn't preclude Congress from weighing in when necessary. So we appreciate your testimony, and um, uh, with that, this uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you.